Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the War Report. Now we are a week behind so we may run a bit longer however whenever I say that it's usually about the same length or you know when I say it's shorter it'll be longer so you should know to take my initial prediction for the show at no value okay my just ignore whatever I just said previously because we're just going to get right into it with just a lot of the news we've been dealing with is of course just a continuation of a lot of the previous news, but I'll start with the, let's just say, less serious stories first, and that would be starting out with the French election. Macron, to nobody's surprise, has won this. Now, Le Pen had a better showing than last time. It was about a 55 versus 45 versus a 65 versus 35 last election. So the right-wing gap is closing. However, people say that is just the eternal joke played on the French right-wing, that they will never get to that threshold, that they'll be allowed to come just shy of it, but they will never be able to seize that actual threshold. Uh, aside from, say, more mainstream right-wingers such as the French Republican Party, but any genuine rightist movement in France will always just be robbed of that because of the two-round election system, which I am starting to understand where they're getting at when they refer to that in particular. But, as predicted, Macron pulled this off. Now, there was polling done. Now, as for the exact sample size, I don't have that off the top of my head, that when most Macron voters were polled why they voted for him, it was a vote against Le Pen rather than a vote for any of his particular policies or support of him as a even just a political personality. Which I don't think anyone can really say is a surprise because Macron is able to waffle back and forth. For example, he will take the, well, it's a civilizational problem when people come here and have eight children. He'll do that sort of stuff. Or I'm the Jupiterian president, and then on the other hand, there's no political culture or for example, when he calls himself a Maoist. Now, I think people know <laughs> well enough not to take him at face value with any of these. In fact, there's actually a really funny political compass of Macron's statements that somebody has made. And, I, I mean, I'll give him credit for this. He's good at weaseling in between positions. He's good at just changing the frame of conversation at a moment's notice. I'll have to give him credit for that much. Where most politicians, they have their set script and their so-called political position, and they'll stick to that, they will deviate very little. Macron can be whatever he needs to be for the situation, but also has the benefit of not really committing to anything, hence his liberal, centrist personality. Now, with that being said, seeing as Le Pen has, yet again, failed to secure any victory, now, how much let's just say, meddling there was in this election. I can't say whether that be from internal or external factors. Maybe there was uh, shenanigans similar to the U.S. 2020 election, but I think it's much less likely in this case. I think it just makes sense that with the two-round system, with the way things are set up, that the French electorate fell into line with who they were supposed to vote for. Now, again, seeing as the status quo has won, it will be... Business as usual going forward, Macron will continue his same routine, and I suppose the biggest question in Europe is, of course, played to Russia and Ukraine, which we'll get into after we just cover a few of these other stories first, but really, seeing as it was a Macron victory, there's not much more you can add to the French election. Now, if we were sitting here talking about Le Pen's victory, that would have massive implications just all across the board, but... We can just expect more of the same. We can expect more of the, let's just say, soft support for American imperialism. Maybe next time a Republican or a, let's just say, dissenting American president gets into office, he'll try the uh, independent European power bloc move. Now, of course, the pan-Europeanists, and I won't name any names in particular, but whether they be on the more liberal side or people who think that the European Union could be turned into this uh, great right-wing organization. But point being is, they were very satisfied with Macron's victory, no surprise. It was just the usual suspects, the blue-check class, the journalist class, celebrating the defeat of so-called 
far-right extremism and fascism in yet another country. And it did call into question, was the populist wave so-called from about, let's just say, starting with Brexit in 2016 up until about 2019, 2020, was that just a fad? Was that just a blip on the radar in terms of both American and European politics? And I would say out of all the points that were raised by people who were, I guess you could say, anti-so-called populism, that was one of the better ones is, did we just capture lightning in a bottle and this doesn't really have any viability going forward, or or is it just facing setbacks? Because you can also look at Hungary, which I know Hungary is a much different political situation, and Serbia with uh, Vucic's re-election a few weeks back. But I don't really think it you can compare the two. It's apples to oranges comparing countries like Hungary and Serbia to, say, France, the UK, US, etc. But I would say, despite the electoral support for the liberal establishment, in just about everywhere else, it's completely lacking. People have no faith in the institutions. I would say this is a problem that is endemic across the Western world, where really nobody trusts the competency or even the so-called good intentions of these agencies. I mean, sure, they may be more afraid of scary far-rightists like Le Pen, which, as we saw at those polls, many French voters did claim that as a reason they supported Macron. But with that, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a great deal of confidence in the current administrations, in the current power structures. And the question is, I think everyone understands what these elections really are. It's just a very narrow window of choice for two people who fundamentally believe in the same things, except just with different trappings on whatever pet issue you tend to care about. And I know that's particularly a problem in American politics, but make no mistake, it just across European and Western politics in general, that does seem to be the case where it's some pet issue, whether that be on a hot-button social issue or uh, some minor economic policy that doesn't really impact the structure of anything or you name it, a, a variety of things with that. But once again, you can just expect business as usual with the victory of Macron and it will be used briefly, but I don't think it will have that much gas in the tank to discredit populism because yet again, a sensible liberal centrist expert has won yet another election yes and um some interesting statistics uh that i think will reveal what the game plan for france and for the eu will be going forward despite what they might promise in the short term and that is it emerged after the first round that if you counted all the votes of those under 60, Macron would come in third. Uh, it wasn't clear whether Mechelon or Le Pen would win, but... Um, oh, Generation Nosbel? <laughs> yeah, so I think... I think uh, Macron... Uh, sorry, uh, Le Pen would be ahead of Mechelon. And, you know, The Economist had some headlines about how... Uh, they literally even called it boomers. They even said it, you know, to borrow like youthful right wing speak from Twitter and other social media accounts. Yeah, but just to add on that, in more quote unquote professional circles, I saw it was like a pensioners election that the people living on their retirement funds were the ones who really swung this. Right, right. Uh, but I think this was. The reason I bring up The Economist is obviously The Economist is using that kind of a headline because it wants to persuade center and left center and far left into always voting for so-called centrists who are left, they're not centrists, uh, going forward. And the, the reason for that is because it, it is alarming for them that uh, the youth generally want... Uh, a, a, a more conservative government because it would reflect not just you know their economic concerns but just their general future which would even include cultural concerns yes another point to add uh sorry to keep interrupting but le pen was market 
basically to the left economically even for a populist figure. Now, people pointed out how Trump went against the standard line on economics or a lot of these other people went against the standard line on conservative or right-wing economics. But Le Pen especially was drifting into what you could almost call, for lack of a better term, socialist territory with some of her economic proposals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the thing is, is what they want is to reduce immigration, right? Because the pensioners live in better areas, um, generally speaking. Uh, that isn't to say many of them aren't used to the, to the diversity, but uh, for someone who was in France two and a half years ago, I can say that uh, Paris is an extremely, extremely diverse city unbelievably uh, diverse. And uh, so I didn't get much of a chance to go to the suburbs, which I understand are even more diverse. Um, in other words, uh, the economist is trying to appeal to the youth going forward because the only way they can maintain this in the, in the next election cycle is if they get more um, migrants. It's that simple. So unless there's a, another influx of migrants uh, in the next five years, if if especially, and it does look this way, that the economies in Europe are going to go down. Um, there was a G20 meeting and other headlines around this that I saw was the industrial sector in Germany has taken a 30% hit in inflation. This will affect all of Europe, even though Macron in France want to lead the EU. Yes, uh, this victory will probably help Macron try to achieve that, but it will be a much poorer and ineffectual Europe than it was before the election, before the war. Uh, so I, I just, uh, that little bit of de detail that, uh, that I picked up from The Economist, for me, I think, describes how things are going to go moving forward, not just in France, but, well, you know, in France, but other European countries. I think the same thing can be said for the UK. Uh, we'll see what the next election is going to be like there. You know that they want to get rid of Boris Johnson because they're reviving that whole um, COVID or Corona party uh, uh, nonsense from two years ago. They can quickly forget about these things, but as soon as other distractions like the war are going on. Uh, people tend to forget about it, and that's intentional. The media wants you to forget about it. But it, since the war is not going very well, and if we're if we're talking about the particular, which is the battlefield of Ukraine, or we're talking about the much larger war, which is all over the world and in Europe, uh, that is the war rather than the battle. Uh, you can see that um, because it's not going well, they feel that they have to get rid of Boris uh, Johnson, and so that's why it's being revived. He's uh, he's in the block chop. Uh, he's in the chop block. His latest visit to India did not go well. Uh, India did suspend buying oil from Russia for 11 days, and I saw a lot of uh, you know anti-Russia shills and like really pro-Ukraine accounts uh, celebrating this, whether it was just a telegram chat or whether it was uh, a screen cap somebody had uh, brought my way. But uh, India has resumed. Um, so India was a country that, you know, almost drifted away, but has come back. The ruby to ruble trade is, is, a, is a go and so I would say that um, every side in this battle is becoming more and more entrenched going forward. Uh, but most of the fractures that are happening now are actually happening in the EU. Macron, I, I would guess the EU is looking at him as the guy that's going to unify Europe. I have an How authority, authority that both the EU and NATO have never been more united, okay? Don't come out with, <laughs> this, don't come out with this nonsense. Right. Right. I mean, there's all all kinds of like ridiculous statistics. You know, America is still buying oil and gas from Russia. And so what they've done now is 
instead of like the official way of buying gas and oil from Russia, what they do is they take it off the big tankers that would be holding vast amounts, well over 50 percent, possibly 100 uh, percent, but somewhere between 50 to 100 percent destined for, let's say, some country in the EU, some country that has sanctioned Russia, like the U.S., and what they do is they siphon this off and they put it on smaller vessels. And as long as it's under 50% of that vessel's total capacity that it's carrying, well, then it technically doesn't need to be sanctioned. Uh, the Baltic countries have all doubled their uh, amount of purchasing of uh, Russian gas in the month of March. So, and Russia today has, uh, has cut off gas to Poland. Poland wants it. They can pay for it in rubles. Uh, Poland may have to buy it from Germany. Uh, and, you know, Germany, too, will have to make this decision if it hasn't already. And beginning either tomorrow or the next day, I saw April 27th as a due date, uh, Bulgaria will no longer be receiving gas from Russia. And it depends on Russian gas by 70%. Yes, uh, and ten percent even higher than Germany. You've seen a lot of flip flopping with that in Bulgaria in particular, where it looked like they initially were not going to participate in at least that level of sanctions. So, when it comes to many of these European countries—Germany, Bulgaria, the Baltic states, Poland, etc.—it has been a constant back and forth where it's a few week period of maybe we can get away with it but then when the powers that be start to crack down no we can't get away with it so it's still all very uncertain but i would just assume now perhaps i could be wrong on this that they're going to be forced to stick with one side or the other when it comes to sanctions and depriving russia of energy profits now once again that that would just be an assumption on my part i could be completely wrong i don't know how much longer this walking in the middle of the road, what this tightrope game can go on. But, again, we've seen with at least more strategically significant countries like Turkey that you can play, and even, let's just say, less strategically significant countries like Hungary, you can play this game for quite a while, especially in the face of all of this instability. And, again, the American Empire has much more bark than it does bite. You can talk about whatever mishaps that Russia may have had in Ukraine, whatever, that's a topic for a different time, you know, later in the show, perhaps. But in terms of the American Empire's threats versus its enforcement, I would say, since the beginning of the Crimea crisis, if not before, it shows that the United States, if we're, con if, if we're going to consider Russia a paper tiger, the United States is just as much, if not more of one, in that case, with especially the grandiosity of the threats and the claims it makes to the point where it simply will ca cannot be lived up to even if they wanted to enforce that without starting a war between two great powers that could of course escalate into the big one now i don't think that's going to happen but you'll also notice that the american administration barring some comments here and there has been exceptionally quiet some feared let's just say uh false flag attacks did not come to fruition. And I'll, once again, I'll cover more of this stuff when we get into Ukraine yeah. proper. And also, just also in terms of propaganda defeat, Gonzalo Lira, who was one of the uh, more interesting figures of this conflict insofar as me is concerned, just this guy living on the ground in Ukraine who just does on-the-ground reporting, thought to have been apprehended or executed by Ukrainian secret police, is confirmed to be still alive. So a, a lot of narratives, and I, again, I'll put off Ukraine for later now. But getting into yeah, I just want to say two yeah, uh, go ahead. two things. One of them is about Lyra, and uh, I mean, I know how how angry he made uh, <laughs> his AA called them uh, Ukraine tards. <laughs> I know how angry he made them uh, with his analysis of the war, and you know that's why they wanted to see him dead. Uh, I saw it multiple times in various chats, and of course, I know people were boasting about it, including that tranny in uh, Kharkov, uh, who was bragging like 
he, she, it, um, had helped catch him in, in all of this, but, um... Yeah, the blue check class, just to put a term to it. Yeah, yeah, and this, uh, this Chani actually has two children, but speaking of two children, uh, I never understood why he, like, he's, he's a married man, he has two children. His family is apparently safe somewhere. There are several towns where he could have gone uh, outside of Kharkov in the or in the early days and still reported from there with what friends were saying on the ground. And all of it would have been anonymous. There's nothing that they could have done about it. The last two, three weeks, he was just living in his basement. He, there wasn't even a window he could open up and peer out of, right? And I'm thinking, why are you, like, you're, you're a grown man. Like, he's just a little bit older than me. And you have children that depend on you. Like, you're insane. You should not even be there. Uh, the only reason he's alive is because he's an, he has an Amer American citizenship. Right? That's it. Um, I would definitely have, like, when that uh, Daily Beast writer was trying to sucker him into revealing his uh, information and he might already, I mean, he was doing that even after the article. He was telling you, I'm in Kharkiv. He's going for walks. Uh, like, they know where you are. Like, they know the general area. And of course, you know, there was a, a you know, he had to leave already one apartment after he saw three strange men in front of the doorway. He just kept walking past them. They didn't follow him. Sometime later in the night, he went back and his neighbor said, leave, literally leave. He did. He went somewhere else. He was still caught. Plus, he has Ukrainian friends that don't agree with them and they want to get even, especially because the war is not going uh, as well as they had hoped. And um, it, this is a phenomenon with like a lot of people who are Russian and have Ukrainian friends. The Ukrainian friends are constantly pestering them for more moral support, as if like they can phone Putin and tell him to call off the war. It's ridiculous. Um, where were these people when uh, you know fourteen thousand people in Donbass were 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 killed on a daily level? Like, anyhow. But all to say, he should have left as soon as that happened. If in fact, like. He should have left even before the, the whole thing with the, the Daily Beast. Uh, there are plenty of towns he could have gone into on the other side of the border. Uh, the, 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 there was not, like, you know, the tightening of Ukrainian uh, military around Kharkov in the last days of February. Remember, he stayed there until like the 27th of, of, um, of February in Kiev before he made it to Kharkov. I would say from the 27th to the 5th, he should have gotten the hell out, like just get out. Uh, but he didn't do that. He's lucky to be alive. We don't even know what's going to happen to him later on. Uh, he's not allowed to go on uh, you know, any kind of uh, social media. But that's all I'll say about about him yeah i, I uh, mean I, it's just an interesting case all around of just like this one individual who seems just to have this disproportionate amount of attention and influence on the reporting in it just by being a, a guy with a camera and uh, again it's one of the more fascinating stories i think out out of this like just because of just how seemingly absurd it is but speaking of the blue check class probably the least serious story we have this episode is that Twitter is officially owned by billionaire Elon Musk. Now, I will preface this where I will say I have a very mixed view on Elon Musk. There's a lot he says and does that I simply uh, do not like just on a not only just political but a personal level. I'll admit I'm hard pressed to trust anyone who dabbles in transhumanism. But the good yeah. news is if you pay, if you take the brain chip, if you take the brain chip, you get your Twitter account back. So that's the that's the that's the that's the bargain you have to take. But with that out of the way is he had bought it from of course Jack Dorsey was the owner and up until recently the CEO before he handed off to, uh, some uh, dime a dozen H one B turned tech CEO. I can't even remember his name. 
and Hodger or something. He's he's yeah, Indian. Some. The, I mean, half the staff is Indian. Uh, naturally, I mean, we're talking about a Silicon Valley tech company after all now, aren't we? Uh, yeah. But he had bought it, and his big proposal was trying to make Twitter a neutral free speech platform. Now, for those of you who probably have made your way to the show over the past four years, and most likely understand that a neutral platform it doesn't really hold much water, nothing is really truly neutral, but just the idea that Twitter might be what it was, say, uh, pre-2017, 2018, when the crackdowns really started. I mean, I've already seen that uh, several accounts have gotten unsuspended. There are the concerns, however, with uh, Musk's uh, just insistence for people to authenticate, and not to mention some negative comments he made about anonymous accounts. Do call into question some things like that, but uh, once again, a, just putting all of that aside, but just looking at the narrative of, let's just say somebody who is dissident adjacent, because Musk is certainly not a dissident, but somebody who is dissident adjacent has bought it, maybe not the most uh, popular social media platform in terms of users, but one of the most active social media platforms where ideas really disseminate, where things really happen. Now, of course, you can talk about the the image boards, which you, I would say anyone who's been on the internet any significant amount of time would say that, like, of course, a lot of the origins are there, of course, the uh, the infamous hacker known as 4chan. Now, again, I'm, I'm no expert on this internet culture stuff, so if there's any gaps there, please forgive any, uh, let's just say, information I left out or any information I have misattributed or misquoted or whatever. But point being is, especially when it comes to the political sphere, with uh, so-called mavericks like Trump, they come out of, let's just call it Twitter culture. And mm. that was what really terrified them, because of course it was a big joke, the presidential candidate who got too boisterous online, and then of course he won the primary, then the actual election, then became president. The rest is history, but point being is, I'm not saying Twitter has the capability to overturn the regime, or you know, like what they said about the Facebook uh, Arab Spring connection, how Facebook is going to democratize the world. But point being is, Twitter is particularly effective because it puts the ruling class and the plebeians on the same level, so to speak, where mm-hmm. you can make a negative comment towards some journalist or some politician, calling them a moron or whatever, and you can get more engagement, likes, retweets, whatever, than they could ever hope to get. And it's it's a good platform for embarrassing and delegitimizing powerful people. I'll put it that way. Which is, again, like I said, I don't think you're going to, you know, cause all the change that needs to be done on Twitter, but it's good for chipping away at the legitimacy of the regime, as dumb as it sounds. Yeah. And actually, just before I give my, my take on uh, Musk and Twitter, uh, the, the one last thing I want to say about Macron is, you know, there were riots afterwards, not really as big as uh, as I thought maybe so they might riots. be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, he has a very divided country, but he also has a country that um, feels hopeless. Turnout was less than uh, many had hoped for. And uh, we hinted that if he wants leadership, he's going to be dealing with a divided Europe. He's also going to be dealing with a divided France. Um, and, you know, I would say the next election cycle is uh, is um, probably going to be even more heated than this one. Um, anyhow, uh, to get on to uh, <laughs> Twitter and Musk, uh, the meltdowns have been wonderful uh, to, to watch. Um, you have um, Reich. You have uh, a, a lot of people, uh, uh, maybe distant relatives of Reich, who are very, very upset. And you know, they will tell you that what he's doing uh, is a threat to democracy. Uh, what uh, you know, they've re- they've really established the idea that democracy is not about the popular will of the people but the interests of the po- of the uh, of the majority for the minority that's literally what democracy means and they are part of that minority 
uh, the ruling class. So democracy just means we the people who actually run the shit. Uh, these are the same kind of people, Reich in this uh, example, you know, uh, was tweeting a year or two ago that, um, well, you know, it's a private company. If you don't like it, start your own. Uh, First Amendment does not cover private companies. And now that Musk has bought Twitter, and mind you, he, it's no longer publicly traded. Now this is a private company. He has far more power than Dorsey uh, did. Dorsey uh, let himself get outmaneuvered while he was meditating. And, uh, you know, he was sort of thrown to the side. Uh, but that's not the case with Musk. And uh, I, I don't want to get people's hopes up about Musk. Uh, Musk, nonetheless, is not what the elites want. In the same way that even if Trump overlapped with some elite interests, he is most definitely not what they want. Yeah, once again, and, these are like people who are the outer ring of the elite, where they still get invited to all the parties. They're just not, again, the most popular Well, even that there. they don't... Uh, like, even even most of the parties they don't get invited well, uh, okay, to. Okay, they get inv invited to some of the parties, and the ones they do get invited to, again, they're uh, just sort of there, not active participants, where... Again, right. like not necessarily saying that like they rub elbows with these people, but they're not right, right, they're, right. They're not the inner circle, so to speak. Right, a guy like uh, Brad Pitt is far closer to the inner circle than Donald Trump or Musk, if if that makes sense for people. So it's not just about pure wealth, right? It's ideas. Uh, these guys who are running Twitter, they're not really afraid of losing their income. That's not. That's this is not that kind of capitalism. Uh, you saw Saki basically uh, saying they are unhappy about this. Uh, we've known and we've discussed on this show that basically Twitter became an extension of governmental policies because governments and corporations now are so intertwined that they can pass off to... Um, certain tasks that they want to achieve for uh, social engineering to corporations, right? And, you know, the way they do this is they promise them, like, bailout money, you know, think GM, think Ford. Think how many times they were bankrupt and saved at the last minute. And the give and take of that is that uh, they have to comply everything from with advertising to, you know, that the codifies the government message of, say, diversity, to all kinds of other things that are uh, much more economic and structural. Uh, so, you know, uh, Saki is very unpleased by this. And just the fact that Musk bought this, uh, it's not just mask off. That's true. It's what she was saying was basically a mask off moment. Right. She hinted at bipartisanship and like, you know, they got to work together. They're going to be putting a lot of pressure on Musk. And it's not certain right now because he's not really our guy, whether he's going to cave or not. Right. Um, but uh, at the moment, it, as you said, it's chipping away at the credibility, but it's also adding pressure for th for the government now to actually create more authoritarian measures through legal routes uh, instead of depending on corporations to do that. They can no longer wash their hands and say, we're not responsible. It's beyond our legislative abilities and so on and so on. It's now the ball is in their court and they will have to do this, right? And if they start to appear... Um, I mean, everybody knows they're going to use the line that, you know, everything that doesn't agree with them is uh, Russian disinformation, et cetera, et cetera. But um, they will have to show their hand even more. And I suspect even some of the brighter bulbs in the room will see that this could be a problem. But um, I'll hand it off back to you because I think we should probably also talk about how Musk could be used uh, for 2024. Yes, and that, of course, gets down to the question, 
will Trump be reinstated on Twitter? And of course, Twitter being Trump's main engine in 2016 and even arguably in 2020, most of his political activism throughout his presidency and even, you know, both before and I suppose not really after because of uh, the events of 2021. I uh, did see Twitter is again Trump's primarily primary means of communication with the people, with his supporters. And of course, Musk was a tangential Trump supporter. In fact, he was actually in the Trump White House, but and this could just be the official reason, but he officially cut ties with Trump politically at least due to Trump withdrawing from the Paris Climate Agreement. But point being is they've always been at least incidentally on the same side for this recent political paradigm, for this uh, Trump-era political paradigm. And one could speculate Musk is only doing this. And, of course, I mean, Twitter's a bad investment. You look at how much it brings in versus how much it costs to operate. It's not a good investment. Something that only somebody like Musk with that kind of money to throw around on a vanity project could afford. But it makes much more sense if you consider that you know, he has a political interest in somebody like a Trump getting reelected or getting put back into office in 2024. I wouldn't chalk it up to that exactly, but Musk's motive to do this is almost certainly political. Now, being born in South Africa without an American citizen parent, he is ineligible to become president himself, even though I do think the desire is truly there with somebody with an ego like his that um, he wouldn't even run for like another office like a governor or senator, but he wants the glory and prestige of the title of president, but he knows, obviously because of existing rules and laws, he simply cannot have that. But I suppose the next best thing in his mind, and this is all just speculation, that if he can play kingmaker it almost feels like being able to actually do it, and maybe even just a little bit better, because you get to pick and choose who gets what. And, again, I think that's... I think a large part of Twitter is not necessarily a business decision, but either an ego decision, a political decision, or both. And I'm saying this as somebody who doesn't necessarily hate Elon Musk, but I am far too skeptical to ever consider myself a fan or supporter of his. Right, right. And uh, there's also, you know, the other concerns. Uh, one of the things that we've seen develop, particularly uh, in an accelerated manner in the last two years, is the notion that democracy is very fragile. It's uh, very valuable, high, but highly fragile. Very dear, but uh, very prone to uh, corruption or what have you. And this message also got reiterated over and over again, not just when Musk uh, came back on, not just from guys like Max Boot. Many, many accounts uh, echoed the same thing. And we, we, we've seen it particularly now uh, develop with the war in Ukraine, right? And the idea is that um, democracy is very fragile. Um, Anything can, can, can topple it, and any amount of information. It's why all information originating out of Russia must be banned. Um, and that kind of puts you, that, 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 that kind of puts you looking in a certain direction for 2024. If you look at um, the idea that Musk could be instrumental in rehabilitating Trump. And the reason why I keep stressing the fragility of democracy is, well, first of all, America is actually very, uh, socially speaking, very fragile right now. That, that is true, as is the West. And it will only become more so going forward. Um, however, uh, the challenges now externally are such that they need a Trump that can placate the, the right wing, but also to get the right wing that is in favor of a, a broader, longer war in Ukraine. Ah, uh, yes, referencing I I was just about to bring that up. The yes. uh, academic agent idea. Academic that, agent. Um, yes. That I Trump is, about... is supposed to just be this uh, a contain mechanism to corral the right wing back into a 
let's just say the term, I think a lot of people would use it, a populist in conservatism where you get to say build the wall and you get to talk about immigration. You can even talk, dare I even say, about demographics. But when it comes down to brass tacks, when it comes down to the issues that really matter, like maintaining the empire, uh, you get to criticize the regime, but for not doing enough to uh, to stand up to Russia or uh, you know stand with Israel or whatever the pet foreign policy issue is at that particular moment. You're right. I was so impressed. That's why I sent to you the the article on AA. I thought that was bang on. And I, you know, I know privately we've discussed, uh, you know, could they manipulate Trump? How viable is he? Uh, you know, I know it gets war. hammered to death on, in these circles, but uh, I mean, Trump, let's just say he's not the most financially solvent guy, especially after his most recent campaign and especially since in fact didn't pay off that uh, he does owe some favors to some people. Right. And I mean, what, what Trump himself, Trump's presidency became a containment uh, in and of itself, right? There were certain things that Israel wanted, and Trump was the guy to uh, help them get it. Uh, we've discussed it over and over again many times, uh, you know, the, the topics that we mean, and, you know, uh, we're talking about the Golan Heights, the JPCOA. Uh, moving the the capital to Jerusalem, all kinds of things, and, you know, new peace deals with like Arab countries and Israel. Although that one, it's becoming clear why that has to happen, because uh, going forward, I think Israel understands that it's going to have less power in the Middle East because it's almost entirely dependent on America, and then so it has to find other ways to support itself, which is why they're going to move to the you on uh, when they're going to be trading with uh, with China. Uh, that was pretty big news this week. So um, I, I would say, you know, there's a, there there is a possibility, and it wouldn't be like, uh, you know, they're going to screw Trump over again. It would be, you know, in many ways, you, you call it the potato years, Trump's potato years, you know, late 2018. Oh, yes, the potato Trump. I don't have the meme, but I'm sure you remember... Uh, back yeah. uh, back in 2019, when Trump started becoming really impotent, people would post that really distorted picture of him that just looked like potato, followed by some quote about you know Israel and uh, and uh, you know whatever their movement was to get more minorities to vote for MAGA or whatever. Right, right, right. And so that's that. They would just escalate that. They would develop that. Uh, they would they would pick up from where they left off. And, uh, you know, there's a strong possibility, right? Like, um, it wouldn't even be that much of a rehabilitation. It would just be an extension of what was already developing. Okay, what I'm and just imagining Musk right could now, be the guy. Sorry, it just came to my head. So, uh, I don't know, maybe you don't remember, but I, I want to see if the audience remembers when Biden was doing some campaign event. He's like, you know, I could be the first Greek president. I'm like Joe Bidenopoulos. I can just imagine Trump yeah. going to, like, some Ukrainian yeah. diaspora group and calling himself, like, you know, Donald Trapenko or something like that. Just like, <laughs> yeah, Ukrainians love me. Like, or uh, yeah, back when uh, they literally hate him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it, it's funny because like I've met a few diaspora Ukrainians who like Trump just because of his personality, but like uh, most of them, you know, not that they're exactly the most liberal people. In fact, it's they're very Ukrainian diaspora. Even in the states, are just a very weird contradiction of ideas uh, that I won't get into right now. Uh, but it just it just reminds me of just like uh, you know sort of like when Trump and probably one of the most negative things I can ever say about him is after he made some peace deal or right kind of Golan Heights is when Trump was like you know they call me the king of the Jews like you know just like that yeah, yeah like just like that kind of stuff that's like man it was just complete cringe yeah like yeah and you know uh, it's <laughs> It would just be more of that. We would get the occasional funny quip, but it would be, uh, it would be potato Trump and yields that we've never seen before. It'd be an entire, you know, field of potato Trumps, as it were. And again, I mean, I don't think. It'd well, be what do you think if 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 his Twitter account got reinstated? Um, and, and you, what do you think his viability is for twenty twenty four? 
I mean, okay, so taking a look at Joe Biden, <laughs> Joe Bidenopolis, uh, <laughs> just from a, a mental capacity, they're going to keep him propped up as long as they can. When they absolutely have to, whether that's because of either physical or mental health, they will pull the plug and we'll get, you know, Vice President, uh, you know, Kabbalah Harris, as, as one may call her, with uh, her, her husband, uh, Doug Ermhoff. That's what it is. his name is, if you're wondering why. Uh, she's Kabbalah Harris, but that's, I, I digress. Yeah. I'm, I'm, ha- I'm having too much fun with this. Time to get a little serious. Um, so you have that, and again, like, the only two viable Republicans just based on, uh, I would say, popular support, It's e- you're either going to have Trump or you're going to have DeSantis from Florida. And it would be fundamentally the same thing, except DeSantis would be a bit more eloquent about it, and Trump would be a bit more uh, ham-fisted and uh, brute force as his style. Verbose. Is. Yes, yeah. yes, verbose. But point being is, I-, I could see them letting Trump win in 2024, considering the fact that they had to uh, borrow a term from the great intellectual of our time, Tariq Nasheed, have completely buck-broken him. Where, of course, you know, they, they can, and it, it would create a good dynamic for them, they could denounce the rowdy, out-of-control, unhinged president, while he's also doing everything they want on the important issues. So, I would say Trump's viability for 2024, from a regime perspective, is actually pretty good. Yeah, I would I would have to agree. Uh, I don't know if he would win, uh, but uh, according to something I saw on CNN, uh, one of their uh, anchors said, you know, uh, or maybe it was a guest on CNN, but he said like, you know, they could lie about um, uh, a candidate. They could suppress the algorithm. So that the, it's like he literally mentioned. Every single thing they did to Trump, not just in 2020, but even before, even when he was running for uh, for for the presidency the first time in 2016, a few months later in 2017, uh, they, for instance, uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, had um, no reason not to publish how uh, they, along with Google, suppressed uh, algorithms for Trump, uh, including posts about Trump in each respective um, social media uh, conglomerate or whatever you have. And uh, and even Google, you know? So if you would type in something about Hillary, well, you would get only positive stuff about Hillary. If you typed in something about Trump, it would always be negative. Yeah, even compared uh, to Microsoft, Bill Gates' Microsoft run Bing search, it was an absurd level of bias. Yes, yeah. So you can tell, like, how fragile democracy really is, which, again, is just their power. It's not democracy. So that is how how fragile democracy is. Yes, and... I, I will say, to bring up one of your points, just to hammer home, they always disguise their disgust with feigned fear. Whenever they're actually yes. disgusted or annoyed with something, they say they fear it because it generates more sympathy. It's much more rhetorically useful than being disgusted. And they did that's this right. with uh, J6 a lot, and I would say that's probably the prime example of something like that. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. They, they feign... Like, these are the same people who, you know, they all have their Ukrainian flags, and um, January 6th was an insurrection. But 2014 and made on, that wasn't a coup. That was a revolution. That was, they literally created an insurrection. And then they get a bunch of yahoos with no weapons entering. You know, one of them is shot dead. And, you know, you'll find videos where they're sparring with the police. But then you'll find videos that same hour when they're, when they're being, like, literally waved in. Both on the perimeter outside the steps of the Capitol and... The, the some of the doors inside the Capitol building. Uh, so they'll, they'll they, you know, um, oh, no, but this is a good insurrection, right? And this is and this is what I mean, is they're never afraid to be hypocritical. It, yeah, it's and, and remember, really, uh, you know, over in Mariupol, those are the moderate Nat Sox, okay? They're good because <laughs> they're moderate. Just like, just like the moderate rebels. And uh, it's... It's the same routine over and over, and it, it it almost gets exhausting talking about it, but 
yeah. it's it's worth making these points. Yeah, especially if there's new listeners. Um, <laughs> of course, our listeners, many of them already know this, uh, but and probably even a, g- a good deal of the new listeners. But um, yeah, so y- you know, uh, are they ready for another four years of potato Trump? I mean, I'm guessing that's what's going to happen. Um, I think what they're counting on, too, is you have a lot of dumb uh, Normicon accounts that think like this would never have happened under Trump because Trump would never let Putin get away with it. No, because although, yes, it must be said, Trump was the first president to give Ukraine lethal weapons. He was the first to slap sanctions on Nord Stream 2. The idea was uh, that Trump uh, would never have let Ukraine go to this level, right? Uh, Not that, uh, you know, Ukraine would have been half destroyed in order, like, for it to capitulate and say, we are not joining NATO. Yeah, let's just put Um, it this way. uh, Pre-being overthrown Trump, so Trump's first term, because any talk about Trump 2024 is a Trump that has once again been buck-broken. Despite yeah. all of his faults, he still had some sense of needing to respect the sphere of influence of Russia in order not to inflame the situation. Now, I'm not saying he had some great geopolitical understanding of the situation, but I think just instinctually he knew that poking and prodding the Ukraine situation too much was not going to end well, even just for his own personal gain. Right, and I think the big giveaway is... The real escalation that led to the war in February first occurred in April of 2021. Uh, that's an important thing. Uh, that's an important uh, event to mark because at that point, Ukraine had uh, doubled its uh, um, amount of frontline troops in the Donbass from like 35,000 to like 80,000, and then. Of course, now, it never got to the point of shelling, and Russia at that time, too, brought its forces close to the border of uh, Ukraine on the north, uh, which stopped the escalation. But, you know, in less than a year, and, you know, 10 months later, that whole dynamic repeated itself. Ukraine even added another 10,000. These are figures that basically get batted around. Um but the important thing is they started shelling the Donbass in a way that that intensity didn't exist uh, since 2015. Uh, there's always been shelling. It has never stopped all these eight years. But the intensity that we saw in 2014 and 15, we did not see until 2020, 2022. And that began on the roughly the 15th to the 16th. It escalated at its highest point on the 17th and 18th. And it still persisted even after uh, Putin recognized him. Now, the idea is that Trump at this point would have intervened and told them to knock it off, right? Um, I I don't think Trump was serious about them following the Minsk agreement because each Minsk agreement happened because the Ukrainian forces got wiped out. And, you know, in order to save the lives of encircled forces— each Minsk agreement stipulated that they had to sign on, not just to represent the Donbass, not to not just to respect their decisions, which wasn't to join Russia, by the way, but was to be like semi-autonomous or have, you know, generally more power, but not to join NATO, right? And I think Trump played this idea that he could give them lethal weapons that would make them happy, but uh, you know, they're not going to join NATO. It's okay if they make the threat or whatever, you know, but they're not going to, sh- they're not going to shell the Donbass. We're not going back to uh, 2014 and 15. Um, so the idea is that he would have, uh, th- that he was probably keeping them in check. And I think maybe the, 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 the giveaway is the second impeachment attempt at Trump with the Vindman brothers, right? Um all that Trump was doing was delaying the arms that they were going to get anyways, because frankly, he was preparing for an election and frankly, the Bidens are corrupt and he wanted to prove that they were corrupt. And we know that uh, 
Hunter Biden's laptop. All the emails are authentic. They are his, which is what everybody knew. And of course, the media, including Twitter, made sure that people couldn't access them until after the election. And this is what's so funny about the about that guest on CNN is he says, maybe they'll reveal the facts after the election. Well, that's exactly what you did. So, I mean, I don't know how much further they can go with this, <laughs> but I would, I, I, again, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, I, 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 I just don't know at this point what, what people tolerances are. Now, because you brought it up, I do feel the need to mention you said every time a new Minsk agreement or a reassessment of the Minsk agreement is reached it's because Ukrainian forces have just taken a heavy loss. Well, this is according to the Ukrainians themselves that they've mobilized the territorial defense forces, which is just really the scraping the bow in the barrel. This yeah. is like the, again, the irregulars. Conscripts. If they, yeah, the irregular conscripts, if you will, and sending them to the front line because their forces had been at that point more or less eviscerated. And again, look at it, you can criticize a lot of what Russia's done from a tactical perspective. Again, we've gone over this time and time again, actually looking at the situation. But point being is, whatever losses Russia has suffered, Ukraine has suffered much more and to a much more severe degree as well. And... With that being said, of course, the set for the more or less capture of Mariupol and the force to mass in the east are really solidifying the control. And according to both Ukrainian and Russian sources, it looks like the plan is to create a land bridge that goes all the way to Transnistria, which is a breakaway region in Moldova of mostly ethnic Russians. And... Moldova is an interesting case in terms of that because they are between the crossroads of both the West and Russia. They recently had something of a color revolution with a more pro-Western party coming into power. And with that being said, people are wondering how Moldova is going to respond to this. And you already have the West warning both Ukraine, uh, Moldova and more so Ukraine that they don't want this war to spread into Moldova, that they don't want this war to spill over into t Transnistria because they don't want to deal with the consequences of that. But if both sides are to be believed, trying to establish a safe corridor from Transnistria all the way to, again, eastern Ukraine into Russia proper seems to be what is, is speculated now. Now, this isn't a surprise that Russia would possibly take this move, and we'll see how much it comes to fruition but it was one of that thing, one of those things got, that got overlooked early in the war. That Transnistria has always just it's been a, it's been sort of a joke. It's been mm -hmm. um, the fakest of the breakaway states, where even more pro Russia people don't even treat it as that serious of a prospect that Transnistria will be either independent or reunited with Russia or whatever else. Now, with that being said, I really can't say how serious we should take this, but it does look like that um, one side or the other is trying to drum up this issue, I'd say, far more than it deserves to be, but it looks like almost an act of Ukrainian paranoia that they want either Moldovan forces or their own forces to move into Transnistria to, to nip this in the bud, to prevent this, and I suppose it does make sense when you look at with the way the war's gone now, of course, they haven't captured Odessa. They actually withdrew a lot of the force around Odessa. But Ukraine has lost effective territorial control of most of its coastline at this point. And with the activation of the territorial defense forces, one could only say this war is still going on because Zelensky, not to defend his moral character or political savviness, simply doesn't seem to be able to surrender because of both internal and external pressures surrounding him. And that makes this war into a very large drag. Again, we're seeing more progress with, uh, you know, Kharkov in particular, I know, has been hotly contested. People are saying that this is going to be what determines the war, whether the Ukrainians can mount a successful counterattack if Russia can solidify control first. I have an opinion on that, which I'll leave you guys to guess. But point being is, 
it looks like this war is both simultaneously escalating and calming down. I would say one could say it's escalating in stakes, while the actual military operations seem to be either stagnating or slowing down. But again, on the ground reports are so unreliable when things move so fast. But it, it does look like the course of the war is set. Enthusiasm in the West, even with all the uh, display of solidarity with the Ukrainian flags or the whatever, whether that be in person, on Twitter bios, or whatever else. It seems like the enthusiasm and interest in war beyond calling out the occasional so-called atrocity is really starting to fade. And yeah. again, the, a, people thought there was going to be a false flag over the Easter celebrations, which, I mean, fortunately there was not. And it, it again, it looks like that I think the West had accepted that it had lost in Ukraine for several years now, and this was just a last jit to see if they could uh, bleed out Russia, so to speak, or cause them... Um, more pain than is clearly being dealt out now. But at the end of the day, it looks like that enthusiasm for Ukraine beyond a few circles here and there, even with the attempts at certain atrocity propaganda or certain, you know, using a, let's just say certain inflammatory terms for uh, doing uh, ill towards entire groups of people mm-hmm. as it were, it does seem like even that sort of propaganda is starting to stall out. Right. And you've you've noticed there's been no serious investigation into Bucha. And now um, uh, one determination that has been made is that most of the people who died in Bucha died from shelling from fragments of cannon fire. Uh, not because they were assassinated uh, on the streets um and and of course it makes it makes no sense but more importantly the fragments that they're finding is a particular kind of casing that Ukraine has used in Donbass for years now Russia uses these types of casings as well there's a, two three other countries but most have completely banned them as being inhumane so uh no, re- remember that time when Russia made the feint to Kiev? They wanted a quick capitulation. I don't think at the beginning of this war, Putin wanted any more than recognize the republics, pull your troops back, and promise not to join NATO. You can even be part of the EU. We don't care. But th- this is the, 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 the you, you have to c- comply with this, right? And of course, that would mean that you know, there would be an internal conflict in Ukraine of hardline Azov guys, you know, Kraken, C-14, ADAR, Pravi Sector, all these, there's many, many of these uh, groups. There's not just a few. And then, but more importantly is you have most people who now, uh, they these groups have endeared themselves to, to a larger public in, in Ukraine that identifies with being distinctly Ukrainian and not belonging to Russia, but to Europe. And so that it would have it would have caused this fragmentation within in order to achieve those goals. In any case, the, the Russians tried for this. And even though they took over those areas, and at no point until the Russians a week before their withdrawal, because they announced that they would withdraw, I believe, on the 21st or the 22nd, and they withdrew on the 30th and 31st. So they already made the announcement that they were leaving. Um, so why, you know, why would they do that? And of course, I mean, these guys, the Ukrainian side was very sloppy. They showed people being, you know, who had been killed with white bands. The Russians wear white bands around their arms and legs just to indicate that they are on the Russian side. And, you know, you, you, you'll you even see videos of Ukrainian troops pulling dead bodies to orchestrate them, to compose them on, on, on the street uh, for an, essentially an effective shoot. And, you know, uh, media did it like, like the mayor after. The yeah, once left, again, this is stuff that we've seen from Syria, Iraq, Libya, yeah, all, yeah. All, all the major previous wars over the past 30 years. So this is just really powerful for the course. And I think for some reason because at least on the ground coverage getting so much more of a disproportionate coverage 
on Ukraine, even a lot of people, I would say, on our side are starting to wake up to the fact that these are tactics that they've been using ever since mass media technology has allowed it to. Right. And I think if, I know India doesn't recognize it as a gen, as a genocide or a massacre. And I think even uh, Moldova uh, has not recognized it, which is interesting. So all to say, like, um, you know, you have that missile that landed in Krimatorsk, which turns out it's a it's a Tochka U, which is a missile that the Russians don't use, but that the Ukrainians only use. All of these stories can't even last more than two weeks. Uh, the missile in Kramatorsk at best lasted a week. Um, they're 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 going very rapidly through the through the news cycle. Uh, you know, I had friends who were like, "Oh, did you see this? Did you see that?" You know, and I'm like, "Dude, it's it's not even going to be news in 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 two or three weeks. It's not relevant. Uh, it's not the big picture." There are people I think who pay too much attention to to the Western media concerning this war. Um, I have to I have to confess. So I have a very normy uncle and um, something else I'm going to say that might make some people mad. Men who only have daughters are extremely normy. These guys are very pro-government because they understand that their daughters depend on the government uh, for many, many things that in previous eras that they those daughters would be dependent on him well, but just, he I'm, no I'm, longer well, I, I think i think i can sum up what you're saying not to cut you off too much but if you want an autistic wonder child 99 percent of the time you're going to have to have a son <laughs> right so um he was over and a, a friend of the family was over and he and and, and i literally told him i said um it, it, i said i hardly even watch western media the only time i watch western media is when they begin to seethe and cope I, and my uncle immediately turns around, like I just started talking about his mother or something. And um, uh, I said, I love, and then I decided to e go even further. Um, I love watching their disappointment. I love watching their hopes get crushed uh, because um, the media pumps them <laughs> up with all kinds of enthusiasm. And then they have to admit that they're actually losing. I go, I definitely watch it when that happens. That's very entertaining. And he was like, he wanted to say something. He wanted to interject. Anyways, my friend left. That never, I saw him out. And, you know, the conversation never happened. Uh, so you have a lot of these kinds of guys who are, um, even if they're socially conservative, right? You know, they have a lot of faith in the government because they have to, right? I mean, he's also a pensioner, so on and so forth. Um, I, I just find these types uh, unbelievably annoying. Uh, uh, it, it just um, there's there's there, there's not a hint of a of a rebellious streak or even just you know basically uh, being more analytical, um, but just full on uh, believing in the civic religion of uh, democratic liberalism. Anyhow, um, yeah. It, so now that I've wandered way off topic, um, I think. I, I mentioned it on the on the last show. I mean, I have people who who bring it up with me, and that is like, um, you know, we've discussed in the show how the Russians basically pulled very fast into Kiev because they wanted to uh, a capitulation, and they were stuck on the roads and they were getting pinged off. And for a lot of people, well, that shouldn't happen, right? That that shouldn't happen, and you know, maybe it shouldn't happen, but that's the way they went about it, and I don't think they had any serious I said it again, and I've always said it. There was never any serious attempt to militarily take over Kiev. What they wanted was a peaceful capitulation in Kiev. Um, also worth mentioning is um, that airport that they took over. Um, that was never taken back until the Russians decided to leave. Uh, not Irpin, uh, Bucha, none of these towns uh, did the Ukrainians ever recapture. Uh, despite their shelling, this, despite their attempts, right? Despite how thin um, of a control they had over these territories. And now they have, um, and I always said that uh, the Russians are willing to make, uh, to take heavy losses. I said that even before, like on the day after the invasion, when nobody knew about any losses, 
uh, you remember I said that they would, because I, I feel like I can speak for somebody who's been to Russia several times, what their mentality is, how they view war differently than the way the West does. Um, uh, but I think there's other considerations early on why the Russians wanted a, a quick capitulation. And that is, I don't think it was certain for them what other big players besides China, how they were going to side with Russia. And this is why diplomacy began on day one of the invasion or the day after the invasion, the, you know, the day after the night before the attack, the, after the attack. And what that essentially was doing was giving their partners who might be considering abandoning them. Because remember, you know, remember when America invaded Iraq and they were taken off the SWIFT uh, monetary system and, uh, you know, th their, their dollar was no longer the, the world default currency and everybody sanctioned them. Remember when that happened? Oh, of course, it, doesn't, it, it never happened. America never has to face those consequences. Look, uh, we lost free not... fries and French wine, okay? I think that's far worse than anything <laughs> any, any Russian has had, had to suffer, ever, okay? I'm sorry, but it just is. <laughs> right? So th there's, um, so you're talking about two very different countries and with very different capabilities, right? So I think part of the reason they wanted this is they wanted their partners to be able to argue and say, look, they're trying to fix an agreement here. They're not asking for this, this, and that. They're asking for what they were asking even before they launched the invasion. Uh, they're not trying to um, bomb the smithereens out of, uh, out of uh, Kiev the way the Americans bombed Fallujah. Um, that's not what's happening here, right? And that gave arsenal, basically, diplomatic arsenal to their partners to properly support them. And as the war has dragged on, what do you see? Well, there were attempts. Uh, we didn't get to talk about it, but, you know, uh, Imran Khan of Pakistan was ousted. We don't know where that was going to go. Initially, India did very well, but then it capitulated for about 11 days, and now it's switched its mind again. Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been quite steadfast, and Israel has been a surprise, frankly. Um, to some degree. So uh, now that things are for sure, uh, you, you see that Russia does not feel like its economy is going to crash. Uh, it has partners that are that are going to support it. The vast majority of the East and the global South are absolutely on Russia's side, including Argentina, not just Brazil. Brazil is, you know. Brazil's deep state and their media have, have lost their minds. You know, they want Bolsonaro out. He might get kicked out. So all of these things have to be considered, right, when you're with Russia. Like, when you have Russia's economy, you can't just do things like other countries, even if you say, well, their military is almost the same. It's not how... Again, very uh, narrow-minded ideas of, about this conflict. Ukraine is the battleground. The war is the world. And whatever the outcome, the, in the bigger scheme of things, everything has already happened. Everything has already happened. The, the devaluation of the, of the American dollar, you're going to have more and more countries who are not going to be trading and using the American dollar. Uh, your, you know, the uh, Russia's ruble right now is better than it and was once again, e even in January. All the narratives, in spite of what's going on, despite the fact that they actually have managed to get them in line temporarily, Europe's confidence has been shaken. As Borrell himself said, yep. we need to find a way to normalize relations with Russia. Yeah, they they know. I mean, the reports I have seen. Okay, so Sunday morning, I saw. Uh, according to Ukrainian, uh, official Ukrainian sources. So we're recording on a Tuesday. People are going to hear this on a Wednesday. So I'm saying 48 to 36 hours ago, Ukraine said that in the, in the last few days, 
they have lost 43 villages in the area around in the Donbass, right? Because the Russians have pressed well past I I Izium right now, Izium, and they are getting closer and closer to Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. Um, the reason you're seeing conscripts go there, um, and, and I mean, if you're following any of these channels on Telegram, uh, the Ukrainians are taking enormous losses right now. Um, Easter was celebrated in Mariupol. The week before, schools opened up in Mariupol, as have hospitals. Azov is underground and it is dying. I have seen videos of guys who are wounded. There's, it's very sad. Um, their wounds are going like brown. They refuse to surrender. And this play of attacking uh, Transnistria uh, for the Ukrainians, because of course Zelensky said last week that uh, Russia's gonna attack Moldova. I mean, what he's doing is he's, he's telling you what he's going to do next, right? Uh, that will draw Russia in, just like Biden says, oh, Russia's going to invade, Russia's going to invade. It's like, well, yeah, because, I mean, <laughs> Ukraine amassed eighty to 90,000 troops against Donbass and started shelling them like there's no tomorrow and would not stop. Uh, the, the, the Russians evacuated between seventy to 80,000 people before the invasion. Uh, dozens uh, killed in, 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 in that time because they were bombing in, uh, residential areas. Now, um, the other reason what, uh, that they want Transnistria is, as I found out listening to the Dren, is there is some enormous stockpile of weapons. Now, they're old, they're from the 70s or 80s, so how well are they going to work? I don't know. But that gives you an idea of how desperate they are right now for armaments, right? And the guy the new Atlas, Berlitich, you know, uh, who was a Marine, you know, said, you might think 500 million rounds is a lot, but the way things work in a war, when you watch those videos, those guys aren't even aiming anywhere, right? That's because there's, that's suppressive fire. And you're using a ton of bullets to do this. And you have the other guys who are finding a vantage points in order to begin picking off the enemy combatants. So they are running out of uh, material, even though uh, Europe has promised um, Ukraine more weapons, including Canada with uh, artillery guns, uh, lots of javelins, uh, you know, stinger missiles and, and all that. Uh, and I don't know if Germany was trolling, but they promised them 88 leopard tanks. <laughs> now, I don't... <laughs> 88, isn't that, isn't that weird, eh? So... Yeah, you, uh, yeah, I mean, you can't make... I, I, I have to, <laughs> Like, there, there are, like, embedded cabals of shit posters in, the, like, in every world government. It's... <laughs> almost amazing. It is almost amazing. It couldn't be 89. It couldn't be 87. 88. Uh, now, they can only promise about 22 this year, and others will come uh, throughout 2023. Uh, just some important details. I don't know if this is Le the Leopard 1 or the Leopard 2. The Leopard 2 is a, uh, is a better tank. And... Uh, if you compare the Leopard 2 and the Abrams to the T-72, even the latest variants of the T-72, the Abrams and the Leopard are a better tank, particularly the Leopard 2. So from what I've seen, 20 shots, the Leopard and the Abrams, they're going to hit 19 out of 20. Uh, the T-72s are scoring at about 12 or 13. So not nearly as effective. The Russians do have the T-80, which is a significantly better tank. I don't know if it's as good as the Abrams or uh, the Leopard 1 or 2. It will be better than uh, the T-72s, which are considerably older. The first one that I've seen now is in an area just north of Kharkiv. That's of, of uh, photos of that. So the Russians have not 
uh, thrown in any Armatas or T-80s, and we might see them sooner. Um, the other advantage, of course, of, not, of Russia not putting in all its forces going in outnumbered is that the possibility of a war breaking out, a spreading, is hot. Like, it's, it, it, it's very possible. Um, people are now even suggesting, you know, remember the, the, the Moskva ship? Um, I think Dmitry Orlov did a thing where he said, if you look at the damage where it was done, where it happened, it couldn't have happened for, if two missiles uh, were sent from from the Ukraine side. It looks like it, they would probably have come from Romania or Moldova. That's interesting. That that right? is, um, especially considering that's a lot interesting. Of he said, now he says that, that if if it was two missiles, right? You know, the the British have sent in their SAS they're in Kiev, apparently training. We don't know if they're doing more. We don't know if these were mines that were placed there. We know the stories uh, coming out were false. All 500 died, including the captain. Well, you know, three days later, the captain is at a ceremony, uh, a celebration in Sevastopol, so he didn't die. The Russians are saying one dead for sure, 27 missing. Uh, that's still unacceptable. Uh, we still don't know what happened. You know, some Russians think it could have been sabotage. Uh, they thought that because uh, way back when the Kursk submarine sank, some people thought it was like really fanatical Dagestanis that were on board that might have done that. We don't know if it, there were some guys that were more sympathetic to the Ukrainians, you know, and or are Ukrainian themselves and, you know, sabotaged, um, which wouldn't be that hard. Uh, the the arms that it's that it's carrying and caused the the fire to break out um neither america or russia is has given the final word on this so we don't know yes and with that being said um again, oh I, just I, one more yes, thing yes I, go ahead go ahead i i'll say this the 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 ukrainians will literally film blowing up like a like an ambulance or like um, anything that moves that, that, that could be construed as being Russian, right? But not two Neptune missiles that are launched. I've literally seen them tape other attack attempts on ships, um, armored personnel carriers, but not this. And I found that very strange. Uh, everything else they'll videotape, you know? A, a tank on a road uh, across a farmer's field, boom, you know, it gets hit. But they won't tape this. And uh, to me, that was always suspect. So, you know, we'll have to wait for an answer on that. Yes, and with that being said, it does bring up the interesting question about the escalation of war, where said missiles may have come from. And in terms of escalation, there's also a funny case of the exact opposite, where... Sweden and Finland, which are quaking their boots at the possibility of a Russian invasion, have been <laughs> given the no-go by uh, Croatia, for example. Now, I believe it's uh, I believe it's a two-thirds majority of member states in agreement in order to be accepted in the NATO. But Croatia, which is typically thought to be one of these Eastern European nations that it's allowed to have controlled nationalism that can be funneled into, I suppose in their case it would be more against Serbia, but to an extent against Russia. And with that being said, it looks like they have no real interest in seeing the expansion of NATO, which I do think is one of the things you get, like, outside of Poland and the Baltic states, I think a lot of the Eastern European nations have the attitude that they've gotten theirs and want to slam the door behind them, which I really can't blame them for. And they have no interest in seeing the expansion of NATO. And it looks like, again, outside of Poland, the Baltics, the UK, and the US, the idea of just adding these random countries into NATO that aren't really of any strategic benefit and would be more of a burden than a help in the outbreak of major war, it again, those it seems like that some air of sanity has come over most European peoples and they are rejecting that. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't know, because, you know, the, this, this whole 
attempts at peace and negotiations and settlements, it's, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's a disaster. Uh, how serious is Burrell? I mean, I, I heard even, you know, I heard some reports saying Blinken is saying that we need a peaceful agreement. Now, timing wise, I can understand that because in both situations back in 2014 and then 2015, Merkel literally had to come to the rescue. And that's how they saved the, the majority of their military, right? Um, I don't know if that's going to happen again. It may, it may. Uh, the other thing about going with uh, a hasty approach and a slow approach, which caused uh, more casualties than, let's say the Russians would have liked, or rather more casualties than the mission, uh, let's say required, if there was going to be a quick capitulation. And what that did is it basically set up a Russian public that are saying, no, 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 we are, <laughs> no, we are keeping this land that we're taking in the South, but there is no way we're giving that up. This is no longer part of the process. Even when they had the peace talks in Istanbul, uh, most Russians thought uh, capitulating to the, to the Ukrainians, although the Ukrainians never the Russians never said that they wanted the, the South. So back around March 10th, March 11th, uh, all that the Russians formerly wanted on paper was no joining NATO, recognize Lugansk and Donetsk and Crimea. And um, you can join the EU if you want, but you can't join NATO. All right, which is in many ways, like the, you can join the EU, but not NATO. That goes all the way back to like the beginning of the Maidan. <laughs> so I mean, they, course, I would say like even even before that one came to just await with Georgia and the I believe it was the Bucharest conference where they announced their plans for the wealth extension mm -hmm. of the EU and NATO, where they don't mind a degree of Western economic influence in these Eastern European Eastern European countries, yep. and arguably from an economic perspective. They serve as a good go between between Russia yeah. and the Greater European Union in terms of economic development and benefit, but the idea that they're going to join this military alliance on their doorstep is where they simply draw the line. And I discussed this with Ukraine in particular, where again, it's countries like the Baltic states or uh, Romania or Poland, being in NATO is unfavorable, but when you cross that line into Belarus and especially Ukraine it becomes intolerable because not only mm -hmm. is it the distance that they've closed, it's the symbology of it. It's the idea that they're trying to break apart what many people in yes. Russia understand is the triune Russian nation as the historic Russian nation or the great Russian nation where they are fundamentally declaring that Ukraine, which also claims to be the successor of the, you know, great Kievan Rus. Now, of course, their narrative has changed and flip-flopped several times. The point being is this heartland, this birthplace of the Russian nation, the Russian civilization, if you will, is trying to be, is at the mercy of a hostile foreign power. And again, this has been, just loosely speaking, a narrative throughout Russian history when, for example, Kiev was occupied by the you know, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth or various other powers, or when that section of Ukraine, at least, was outside of the control or scope of Russia. Now, of course, there were the more far-flung western regions of Ukraine that were always more influenced by the Polish and the Austrians and the Germans, etc., but there was always an understanding of a degree of separation with that, particularly along religious lines, uh, Orthodox proper versus the Union churches. But right. point being is, uh, you know, Kiev proper, that real, like, heartland of Ukraine, is viewed as an attack on the Russian birthplace, as it were. And that's where they draw the line. Like, while NATO extension and expansion is a major concern of Russia, Ukraine in particular is the no-go zone because of what it implies. Like I said, I'm sure they're not happy... It, it's to have... a doorway into Russia, Exactly. In they're not happy to have missile installments in Poland and Romania, but they can they can live with that. They can adapt. But Ukraine is where they draw the line because it is that uh, last 
it is that last step before entering into Russia proper, and arguably they have entered into Russia proper with what it means symbolically, especially the city of Kiev. Right, and it's in a in a sense, it's like they can't they can tolerate Poland even more so Romania, though they they don't want it. But for them, on on a sort of bigger metaphysical plane, they can't tolerate like their own brothers pointing weapons at them that's not something they can tolerate and uh that that, that's a big deal for them and just to go back to the 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 deal that the eu had offered the ukrainians which uh you know they said that initially they said they wouldn't have to make a choice and of course they flipped which is what the eu did it was a pro the, the entire deal is a provocation when you break down two important points one is uh for them to join the eu Russia has to pay off Ukraine's debt. So the EU was not going to pay it. Even though Russia was paying off Ukraine's debt from the Soviet Union, and it was the only state that they didn't have to go 50-50, which it finished paying off in 2017, by the way. But not only did Russia have to pay off like this remaining debt that it had accrued uh, after that period, like... Um, Separate from the, the Soviet Union is what I mean, right? So it was a debt that it had occurred um, in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, not only would Russia have to pay for that, but at the same time, the, that original EU agreement in 2014, 2013, stipulated that joining the EU would, be also, would also eventually require joining NATO. Well... I mean, you're not really giving Russia any choice, are you, right? Um, I mean, if, if, if Russia had its way, like, Ukraine would have been, its, it's territorial integrity would have been the same had, um, had the deal been uh, more honest on the part of the EU, had it been more gracious, but as we've always said, even like I think the first or second year I started doing this show with you that I was invited onto the show, uh, I always said that the whole point is to break up Russia. That's the whole point. And it's been an ongoing European attempt for at least two centuries now, right? Um, you, you had Germans and other nationalities, British, for in, for instance, who said, "Well, you know, I mean, the Russians are oafs. They're, they're they're rude. They're coarse people. Why should they have all these uh, all, all, all all these uh, wealthy deposits of minerals and uh, especially after the Industrial Revolution, oil and gas and so on and so on." So there was always some excuse making, not very different than how the Israelis say, well, you know, we made an oasis of this place. It needed us, right? Um, very much in the same way that, you know, American colonies felt like uh, it's our, our, you know, we can make something far more of this land than what these oafs are doing here. Um, so it was, a, it was a similar kind of idea. And I think we're, I think we're seeing like what could possibly be the beginning of the end of that kind of thinking. Because they just won't be able to do it. The, the stakes are that high. Yes, and I would agree. And with that being said, also, the goal of breaking up Russia also serves to the idea that while they are of a different civilizational identity, Russia is still generally understood to be a white European people. And it's much easier for, say, a, let's just say a European distant, not that I think that, you know, the Russians are going to actively support, for example, a distance coming to power, maybe incidentally, but point being is, like, I don't, I don't see, like, any active Russian involvement to help distance take power in, say, France or whatever, but, but that's aside the point. But if you're a European distant, you can look at Russia, and you can look at the Russian rejection of liberalism in a much different way than you can look at the Chinese rejection of liberalism because the Chinese are, do, are fundamentally a, a far, far separated civilization where you can't really bridge those gaps, whereas with Russia you kind of can, and it, it works both ways, hence the reason that they've always wanted to so-called westernize Russia, that it shows that 
there are other ideas beyond what we've been force fed for the past 75 years, the past 80 years, and even you want to go back further, the past 100 to 200 years. And I do think, once again, it's the idea of can you cope with industrial society without some sort of liberal ideology? And that's the question that we're trying right. to answer right now. And yeah. I think one of the biggest things they fear about Russia is, while I'm not saying Russia is the most prosperous country in the world, and again, just all the disclaimers, yeah, yeah, they have their problems, blah, blah, blah. But point being is that the fact that they can build a functional illiberal society, a functional illiberal industrialized society, it shows it can be done, particularly on a European scale. And I do think that terrifies them. That it Russia does, because China is also another example. Yes, and like I said, I think Russia in particular when it comes to maintaining control over Europe, but China just as a whole, because again, Russia, there's much less of a bridge to gap between you know Europe proper and Russia than you know Europe proper and China. But point being is, they fear both for that reason, but Russia in that particular context. Yeah, you know, and if people want like uh, a, a bigger deep dive uh, into R Russian history and what we're talking about at this stage in the show, um, check out, uh, we've plugged them bef before, but check out Russians with Attitude. Now, you can find them on Spotify. Um, uh, they have, that's where they, the, the shows that um, eventually become free or their trailers in this sense, in this regard that I'm going to bring up, uh, are listenable. And they did a bit of a deep dive. I mean, I just heard the 19-minute trailer on a guy named Galkovsky. Uh, Galkovsky makes an argument, and it's, a, it's the argument that we've made on this show before, that, of course, uh, the Russian Revolution was a color revolution by the West on Russia. And, um, you know, we've brought up how the Americans uh, helped out Trotsky, uh, how the Germans helped out Tr uh, <laughs> Lenin, and the British helped finance this thing. And then, you know, the tacit little help of uh, maybe we'll help the, the white Russians. Yeah, blah, blah, the blah, expeditionary but... forces that hung out in Siberia away from the main action. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And, and, um, but he brings up Galkovsky vis-a-vis um, um, -vis through the reading of, uh, of uh, Russians with that attitude, brings up something, uh, a few facts that are very salient. Okay. okay. So take, for instance, um, um, a, a, a Latvian guy, Peters, um, who claimed that he was illiterate and worked, um, he was a, a, a dock worker at a port on the Baltic Sea in Lithu and Latvia. Uh, he marries a baroness in, um, in Britain. And now he's important because when the Re Russian Revolution happens and it's solidified, um, Russia suddenly loses all its railroads in Persia. All those railroads belong to Russia. And virtually all the factories in Persia belong to Russia. All of them for free were given to the British. Right. So um, that's an odd thing, uh, and I'll bring up just one more uh, tidbit, and that is in 1905, uh, Britain, of course, sided with France and the, the, the Japanese-Russian War, but Germany sided with Russia. And we've brought up the Salisbury um, letter, a suggestion to the the future king king george um of uh of of, of britain uh in the late 1880s possibly 1890 i honestly i have to go back to my notes yeah, it was the 1890s i believe to george v who would later be george v yes yeah and so uh exactly george v and so basically you know uh, his Salisbury's recommendation. Salisbury is part of the Cecil family, by the way, which goes all the way back to Queen Elizabeth I. And they used to call the Parliament building in, in the Victorian era the Cecil Hotel, which gives you an idea of uh, the level of influence. And so, uh, so his suggestion was: be friendly towards Russia, but maneuver Russia against Germany. 
because Russia, although being the main threat, it is Germany that is the more immediate threat. So Germany must be destroyed, and then afterwards Russia. So, uh, you know, there were suggestions of uh, revolution, an Islamic revolution in Russia, and, of, and, and, a, and a war with Germany. I mean, two of those three things happened. Uh, the Islamic part wasn't very successful, but the other two did, and it worked. So, um, yeah, Russians with Attitude, you can find them on Spotify. They're a breakdown of Galkovsky. If you subscribe, you can hear the whole thing. It sounds fascinating, to be honest. Yes, and uh, again, I will credit them for... Uh, they, they do a lot of really good work. Even uh, even the free content they do is, is a lot of good work. And I'm just saying, if you're going to give yeah. money to any person on the internet, I would say they are certainly of the top people that would warrant it. Uh, now, I don't know how sanction laws might affect, you know, uh, that sort of international <laughs> money transfer, but, you know, we can see. We can see how that all works out. Uh, but that's that's aside the point. And, again, it does get back to the fact that, fundamentally, what we're dealing with right now is just this retooling, at least in an immediate sense, of Salisbury's foreign policy. And, again, we saw this in both World War One, and World War Two, where Germany became that more immediate threat that needed to be put down. And then, of course... The Soviet Union, which was supposed to be the tool to destroy Russia, in a, in a way, now again, you can argue about a lot of the negative effects on this, uh, of the Soviet Union on Russians as an ethnic group and their control over their own land, whatever, in terms of different ethnic quals that popped up during the Soviet Union. Point being is that land power on the Eurasian landmass, for lack of a better term, did remain, even if that was under the banner of the hammer and sickle and the ideology of Marxism-Leninism versus, say, the previous imperial ideology or whatever else. So point being is they still found themselves in the same position that they were in the 1890s. And honestly, even though a lot has changed, there is still quite a bit of similarity to the position of the British Empire in the 1890s, uh, juxtaposed to Russia as the American Empire juxtaposed to Russia. Now, the power dynamics have greatly shifted, but there's still some kernel of truth and still some applicable information we can derive from that in particular. And once again, if you can find Salisbury's letters, and honestly, we've been talking about it for years. We just never really put pen to paper <laughs> on actually doing a stream on uh, Salisbury's proposals and predictions in particular because they certainly weren't uh, discussion. Honestly, I would say Anglo-Russian relations going back to the post the immediate post Napoleonic era warrants its entire episode of its own. And, you know, we might put something like that together one day. No guarantees being made, but that's something we've often discussed behind the scenes if you want just a little sneak peek back there. Now the last story I have for today is completely unrelated to Oh anything. wait. Yes, go, ju ahead, go ju ahead. Just be just before we go on to the last thing. If you want to find the Salisbury letter, look up a YouTube channel called Sky Archer. Okay. It's not spelt in some funny way. Sky Archer. And it's Terry Boardman who has a lecture series on, um, it's just titled Our uh, Responsibilities for World War I, meaning the British responsibilities. He's very even handed. You know, he'll say everyone was responsible to some degree, but what, was, what were our responsibilities for this? And that's where he brought up Salisbury's letter. Sky Archer, Terry Boardman. Yes, um, I haven't personally looked into that, but I can co-sign it if you're suggesting it. Now, the last story we have is the mysterious accidents at all these food pl uh, processing plants within the U.S., whether those be factory fires, as you know one may call them, or explosions, or even plane crashes into just a dozen or so food processing locations across the U.S., and of course... This does play into the idea of the fact that a lot of what's happening with the supply chain is deliberate, which I do think there is some merit to that. But again, you see all these methods of sabotage. Perhaps they're trying to do two birds with one stone, and uh, again, sabotage the supply chains while also saying that, uh, say, for example, uh, like sleep, like Russian sleeper cells might be behind this uh, <laughs> final attack on our supply chain. Because I can hear that narrative already in my head. I, that's something they would go with, but it is just a very mysterious, conspicuous story that, I mean, 
I, I first heard about it through Tucker Carlson, so take that for what you will. But just this mysterious uptick in just these damage at food processing plants, or maybe we, maybe perhaps the simplest explanation is the most accurate. Perhaps we're just a crumbling empire with crippling, uh, you know, crippled infrastructure, which is causing these things to happen. So no matter what way you slice this, there's not really a, a positive spin you can put on any of this. And I, I'm just really curious, like, how, because I mean, everything is attached to the narrative in one way or another, even the dumbest of stories it are attached to the narrative in one way or another. And I'm just trying to really figure out how this piece really fits into the puzzle. And maybe you guys have ideas. Maybe you personally have an idea. Uh, but I, I'm at a roadblock here. That's honestly what I'm bringing it up. I'm just trying to bounce ideas mm. off you guys. Well, I mean, Bill Gates bought up all that farmland. So, I mean, does that mean it was intentional? Does it mean all of them were intentional? None of them? I don't know. But... It, it is a strange coincidence because that's been in the news for the last two years, Bill Gates, particularly in 2021, that he's buying up all this farmland, you know, and, and the, the similar things are kind of happening in the, in the UK where lots of government land is being bought up and some people fear that uh, <laughs> there's a strong uptick in people watching bushcraft videos uh, you, you know, getting out of urban centers. Um, uh, they, the, I, I think one of the, uh, I think it was the Treasury Department or something, some some department associated with the U.S. government, or some bureau, some agency was warning people against panic buying as well. Right. And, uh, and as far as I know, in Britain, there are uh, unclaimed lands that you can claim. I think the first year you have to take photos of it, uh, show that you're doing some kind of work maintaining it is a process but i actually watched a bushcraft video from last year last year where a guy did do that and eventually he he became o owner of the land so yeah that um doesn't surprise me that there's an uptick in that sort of content with that and with that being said again i i can only uh you know, can't stop myself from thinking that this is, of course, deliberate in some way, shape, or form. And, of course, there's some reason that they're doing all this, which I can only assume is part of the so-called uh, Great Reset, for lack of a better term. And I'm just saying, you know, keep your eyes peeled. Just watch out for this stuff. I can't really give you any solid mm -hmm, advice mm -hmm. on what to do, but uh, more than just, you know, be aware. That's honestly all I can tell you. And that's honestly what I think my primary goal with this uh, entire program is, just to get you guys to, you know, be aware. Yeah, and actually, just just uh, before we sign off, I want to say, chocolate covered uh, grasshoppers are delicious. No, 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 no. <laughs> I've never, I will never eat them. Uh, just a tiny bit of news uh, from Turkey and the Middle East. They're making new incursions into Iraq. They lost three soldiers, then another two, and then recently an officer. Um, so, you know, I. I think Turkey is a country you've got to watch. Uh, they're kind of they've been instrumental blocking any kind of NATO traffic going into the Black Sea, uh, except for the ships that were already there. And um, what are they going to do later? I don't know. The, this is one of the things that Russia always has to keep in mind because it does not have the global leverage that uh, America would have. And um, uh, for instance, they canceled flights uh, of uh, Russian military uh, going to Turkey to go into Syria. Uh, I think it, aff it affects civilians as well. I'm not sure. Russia has workarounds uh, with Iran, of course. So it's just a little longer. But just to keep that in mind, because things aren't going well for Turkey right now with the Kurds, which I think at this point in time actually makes the Americans quite happy. Yes, and again, the entire Kurdish question is still left completely unsolved and just dangling in the air, which, I mean, I think is exactly where they want it, but, you know, with all that being said... Uh, yeah, the Kurds are like Musk. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, uh, the Middle East is still as active and dynamic as ever, even though it is being overshadowed by, um, let's just say, you know, other events, whether that be economic yeah. or... <laughs> Um, the current conflict in Eastern Europe. But point being is, you know, I'm still sticking in. I'm still had to hammer home. Idlib capitulates by the end of the summer. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, uh, the Russians are bombing it more uh, than than last year, so who knows? Arguably, bombing it more than uh, than, than sites in Ukraine. <laughs> if if you want to, you know, take one of the more uh, harsher views of the uh, Russian <laughs> war effort. But you know, point being is, uh, yeah, I think you know, just t- taking a look at the entire situation, that the Middle East it is strange for it to be the second fiddle when it comes to global mm-hmm. instability and chaos. Definitely. Well, with that being said, thank you everyone for tuning in to this episode of The War Report, and we'll see you all on, on the next episode. I'm sure we'll have plenty to cover then. And goodbye. Take care, and don't eat bugs. <laughs> yeah, don't eat the bugs. I don't care. <laughs> uh, they, they, they could be coated in dark chocolate, white chocolate. Just simply do not eat the bugs, okay? Don't eat the bugs. Don't it's not bugs. European. No, no, yeah. <laughs> look, we, we maintain a certain level of decorum and class on this program. If I find out there's any bugger eaters in this audience, um, <laughs> I'll just say it's not going to end well. But uh, with that be being removed. said, um, that was not a uh, call to action or threat to violence or, you know, just, okay, just the normal disclaimers, but this intro has gone on far longer than it has the right to, so I'm ending it right now. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and goodbye. <laughs> goodbye.